Okay. This place that we're going to is what I would consider to be a human-dominated ecosystem. Most of the planet is a human-dominated ecosystem. Even these things, when we look at it and we see maybe it looks really green with grass or it's got a lot of tall trees, sometimes we can take the misimpression that, ah, it's all, it's all good. Um, the footprint of humanity weighs heavy here. Um, and we can talk, we could, you know, slice it just about any way you want, and we can look at that. So, for example, we can look at this. Here's the Mississippi River. We can look at the development efforts that have gone on there. We can look at the um, uh, major oil and gas lines. We can look at the, the human population in uh, the uh, New Orleans or the surrounding parishes, like in this case, Jefferson Parish. Um, you know, just blown, boom, tons and tons of people, more and more people, more and more detritus of people influencing what was going on. It is true that New Orleans is a bowl. Here's, what's this lake again? Pontchartrain, right, Lake Pontchartrain, right? Again, it's not a lake, quote unquote, we call it a lake, but it's really just a, a, a pocket of the ocean, right, salt water. And so all these things have, we, the, the Louisiana term is lake, we call these things lakes. Um, okay, so here's the main urban core, urban center of New Orleans. And if we talk about that area, it really is basically a bowl. So on this side, we have Lake Pontchartrain. There's a levee there. We have the Mississippi River. There's a natural levee there that we've augmented. So we have a, a line here, a line here. And then we have these other uh, levees, these other structures that really, in effect, create a bowl. If we do a cross section, so here we go. We're, we're, we're going to do a cross section of this area here. So if we do a cross section, this is what we see. Here's the city of New Orleans. This is Lake Pontchartrain, the elevation of Lake Pontchartrain. Again, so, so here we go. Here, here's the city. This is the cross section we're doing. Here's the river. Here's Lake Pontchartrain. So A, B, A, B. Lake Pontchartrain is at sea level because it's connected to the ocean, remember? So it's this level. The Mississippi River is higher than the ocean. Why? Because the river is flowing down with gravity into the ocean. So um, the Mississippi is always higher than the lake. This leads to a, um, a, a, one of the many uh, misreadings. There's, there's a lot of misunderstanding as to what happened in Katrina. Um, and part of that's understandable. Part of that is just people not understanding the, um, the situation. But everybody was worried about the levees, over, the, the river levees overtopping. The river levees, by and large, they were fine. The vulnerability was this other side. Okay, we'll talk about why in a bit. But um, uh, have a look at it. This is the elevate, this is the sort of cartoony elevation. Much of the city of New Orleans, this is why we say it's below sea level, right? Here is a bit more um, accurate in terms of uh, Pontchartrain, Mississippi River, and we see that you know so, some of the city is as much as about 14 feet under water, or excuse me, you know, below sea level. Most is not. Most is at or above sea level, but but there are significant chunks that are um, that are lower. And this has been known for a long time. So this is a NASA animation. So let's talk about what happens if we have some flooding events, if we have a bunch of rain, or if let's say, oh, I don't know, a hurricane comes in and shoves a bunch of water into a little valve here and then makes this, this basin grow. So this is what's gonna happen. There's zero meters of ele elevation. There's one meter, two, three, four, five, six, Nothing left, right? So this is very shallow land. We're not talking about a couple meters rise in elevation and, and the area next to the river goes under. Everything goes under. It's a very, very flat place. This is not California. So let's talk about what happened with Katrina. Katrina was a hurricane and we, we, we have a, essentially a recipe to make a hurricane. 
This is my recipe for a hurricane. So number one, we need some fuel. We need, we need to start this big energetic reaction. In the case of a hurricane, that fuel is going to come in the form of warm surface water temperature on the ocean. So warm ocean. Next, you can think of it as needing a nice chimney, a nice fireplace, something that'll sort of help get that, get that mass of energy moving. And so that's going to be atmosphere that's going to rapidly cool. As we go from the surface of the ocean up into the upper atmosphere, the, the, the temperature is going to drop really, really quickly over a very short distance. And that's going to act to pull up some of the air. And then as that goes up faster, it's going to suck more air up and it's going to create this, this sucking phenomenon. Um, high up, high up in the atmosphere, in the troposphere, um, when we have moist, uh, warm, moist wa uh, air, that's going to act as additional fuel. And then because of this thing called the Coriolis force, which isn't a real force, that's what's called an apparent force. And, and if you want to know more that way, I can, I can show you guys some videos. But basically, it has to do with it looks as if things bend to the right. In the northern hemisphere, we hitchhike with our right hand. So things curve. We, when we go straight, uh, things start going straight, then they curve to the right. So this is why we have trade winds where we have trade winds, while we have these different bands of, of uh, atmospheric storms and things. And so what that means, though, is right at the equator, you can never get a hurricane because the air needs to start spinning. So you have to be in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere at least 500 kilometers away from the middle of the, the belly of the earth. And then we need some kind of spark. This is probably the thing that we understand the least about hurricanes. We don't understand exactly what are the, the you know, what's the genesis. Why, why did this one become a hurricane? This one didn't start off. But some type of disturbance. And then we need to have no vertical wind shear, meaning, meaning the winds can't be blowing whoosh, 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 side to side because that will, that will tend to dissipate the storm. So we have to have all this stuff in place. And if we do, then that can set the stage for a cyclonic storm. So let's set the stage. We have two entities that um, predict... For, for forecast, I should say, that forecast what, how many storms we're going to have each year. There's a group in Colorado, and there's a group in Florida, the National Hurricane Center. And so these guys use these huge, giant, massive, supercomputer climate models that they constantly are perfecting, constantly, constantly working, 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 very complicated equations that try to mimic the complex air currents and and energy transfers and all that kind of stuff, the ocean, and all this and that. And they come out with a prediction each year. As we were entering the 2005 season, we were in a period of above normal, a uh, 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 better than, better than quote unquote normal conditions for hurricane formation. So just before anything else happens, we were already um, primed to have a lot of hurricanes or potentially have a lot of hurricanes. In the case of, and we're talking about Atlantic hurricanes here, so normally we, you and I think of El Nino, we think of this big crazy storm system. Uh, El Nino acts to, to mess with hurricane formation. Remember we talked about we have to have these nice, you know, no vertical wind shear and stuff. El Nino acts to, to, to flub that. So the only two years since 95 leading up to 2005, so in the decade before, the only two years we didn't have significant hurricanes were these El Nino periods. Next, the Atlantic Ocean, the SST, which stands for the sea surface temperature, the surface of the water, very warm, anomalously warm, really hot. Remember, that's one of our fuel. That's one of the, one of the key ingredients for our recipe. Uh, and then on top of that, we had really favorable uh, atmospheric conditions, so, so uh, the right types of winds and the right type of air pressure. 
So when we came, when you put all this together, the predictions that were made before the start of the hurricane season were that 2005, so you guys have to really understand this, 2005 was predicted to be 175% above, not normal, but above the hyperactive season normal or baseline. So people are saying, oh my God, there's gonna be a lot of storms and not just a lot of storms like, holy crud, there's gonna be a lot, a lot of storms. And they were trying to ring the bells and warn everybody, hey, 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 everybody get ready. Hey, 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 everybody make sure you have your disaster plans in effect. Hey, 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 make sure everybody is, is ready for what's going on or what, what might be about to come. So let me show you what that means. So this is the this data I've pulled together for you um, is from NOAA and this is using a baseline of from 1950 to just before the 2005 hurricane season. So let's check this out. Here are three things I have listed for you guys. This is tropical storm. This is a hurricane. This is a major hurricane. These are exactly the same things. The only difference in these, these um, storms is how, how, how much energy they have. So they're all the same exact phenomenon. But when it's just sort of a mild storm, we call that a tropical storm. When the winds get rocking and rolling and it gets more intense, we call that a hurricane. And then when it gets really crazy intense, we call that a major hurricane in our parts of the world. If we were around Asia, we would use the term um, typhoon or cyclone. Same exact thing, same exact atmosphere, atmospheric uh, uh, pattern. It's a, it's a cyclonic storm. It's a storm where the wind spins around. Okay, so here we go. In an above normal, or sorry, let's start here. In a below normal season, we'd expect to have, on average, these are uh, Atlantic hurricanes, in the, or hurricanes in the North Atlantic. So uh, in a below normal year, we'd expect to have an average of, say, 6.9 tropical storms, 3.7 hurricanes, and 1.1 major hurricanes, right? So obviously it's way easier, as you can tell from this, to get a, a, a small storm than a big storm. So we always have more hurricanes than we have major hurricanes. We always have more tropical storms than we have hurricanes. Yeah? Okay, so we'd expect, so a below normal, let's look at the hurricane example. So the below normal hurricane season would be 3.7 on average. That means that 3.7 would make landfall in North America. Maybe that's North Carolina, maybe that's Florida, but but uh, be making making landfall. Um, in a near normal year, we're talking not quite double that, about five and a half, five point six. In an above normal period, we would be getting eight point three. If we switch over here and we talk about major hurricanes, in an above normal period, we would have on average four point four, the range of which is two to eight. Cool? The prediction that we made using our computer modeling, some people in our society don't believe scientists can actually predict things. They'll believe in things like climate change and stuff like that, but actually we, we know quite a lot. One, po one point, case in point is this. So before this, these guys were saying, hey, we're predicting, a r the prediction was between five and seven major hurricanes. 9 to 11, reg, quote unquote, regular hurricanes, and 18 to 21 tropical storms. That's what we predicted. This is what actually happened. We had seven major hurricanes, 15 hurricanes, 28 tropical storms. We had so many storms for the first time in history, we ran out of names for the storm. By international agreement, the country, in, this, in our case, were, were the Americas, so we get together and the, the storm nerds, the weather nerds have their meeting and they decide, okay, this year we're gonna use American names and then whatever. Next year we're gonna use Spanish names and this year we're gonna use guys' names. And it, it would, so, so there's this whole agreement. So before the season starts, we have a list of names. And so the first one that ha comes in, we just grab that first name. And it start, always starts with A, an A name. And then the next storm is a B name and a C name. And before this season, we never, nobody ever needed to go past Z. Just nah. This year we ran out of letters. 
going into this time, this is what, this is, okay, so again, this is sea surface temperature is the SST. So this is, and, and uh, hotter is warmer, whiter, bluer is cooler. So um, this is the temperature. So check it out. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's warm here, but man, we get into the Northern Caribbean and it's nor Northern Gulf of Mexico and it's really hot. This is the anomaly. So this means the deviation from the long-term norm. So however you want to pick it, if you want to pick just what the water temperature was, or if you want to talk about how unusually warm it was, when we get right in tight next to the, the shallow waters of the Northern Gulf of Mexico, it is hot. Hot, 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 hot. And this, this, is, this is right before um, in the immediate uh, pre-Hurricane Katrina time. Uh, then we also had, remember we talked about you have to have, we want to have none or very little of our vertical wind shear that would, because we'd start to, you know, start to spin around in my chair here. I'm spinning around. Then if we had some wind, I would kind of, flop, flop, flop. I kind of flop and I wouldn't get that. I wouldn't start working up my spin, 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 spin. So in this case, this is lower wind shear. So this is deviation from normal. And check it out. In this case, the hot, the, the hotter colors here mean aberrantly calm. So we had really calm uh, wind conditions. And that produces Hurricane Katrina. This is a picture of Hurricane Katrina when uh, she was a Category 5 storm. It's very important for you guys to understand this. Category 5 is the, high, is the greatest intensity of, uh, on, on this, this scale of measuring intensity. That's the highest intensity. Turns out that traditional way of measuring hurricanes probably isn't the best way. Does anybody know where we got our hurricane scale, our, 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 our rating of hurricanes? From these guys working for the American Red Cross. So they were doing disaster relief in Central America, and, and, they, and they needed a planning tool. And so they needed, so, you know, storm comes in, boom, devastates this village in Honduras. They, as, as um, you know, first responders, they needed some way to say, oh, my God, we need a bunch of help. Or, oh, my God, we need everybody on the planet to come help. Right? And you don't want to always say, hey, everybody across planet, come help, because then people will stop, stop believing you, right? So you want to have, you want to gauge the response, you want to have the appropriate level of response, right? So they started looking and they cued in on a lot of the damage in these, in these impoverished villages were caused by the fact that these folks had relatively flimsy houses, uh, housing that they were living in. So wind turned out to be a really important predictor. So we came up with our current scale essentially based on that. So the, the category is most closely tied to the wind speed, and that's basically it. So the, the more the wind is, the faster the wind is blowing, the higher the category. And that, you know, that, that, that of course makes sense. So a bigger storm is going to be blowing faster. That, that makes intuitive sense. But it turns out now in this era of climate change, there's other factors that we probably need to factor in. And one of them is really illustrated, I think, very well by this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures of Hurricane Katrina. Check it out. This storm, the, the arms of this storm are going basically from Florida all the way over to Texas. This is a massive storm. The scale of this is hard to understand. This is a storm, one, one discrete storm system that's bigger than states. This is huge. So part of the story with Katrina is not just the intensity of the system, but also the incredibly large size. And so therefore the incredibly large area that would be impacted by this event. Now, the other thing to say is um, this is fundamentally important for you to understand. It's a category five on August 28th when it's out at sea. Whenever our hurricanes come onto land, they immediately start to dissipate. Right? The fuel, that warm seawater that's fueling the, the intense energy exchange and the spinning and the winds, that starts to break down when we hit land because land is not moist and hot on average. Right? So what you'll hear, you'll hear at various times, some of the videos you'll see or some of the people we'll talk to, you'll hear the Army Corps of Engineers, the federal entity that's protecting you right now here at school that certify our levees as safe, 
that that say that you know Miami is safe and and uh, and whatever the Colorado River dams are safe. That same entity was charged with protecting the city of New Orleans from a Category Three hurricane. And so one of the stories you'll hear is the Army Corps of Engineers will tell you, hey, look, we only designed it to withstand a Category 3 hurricane. But Hurricane Katrina's Category 5, you know, we, we just didn't design it to take that. That is a load of horse manure. Because by the time, because Katrina starts, this is the peak strength. As it starts to go inland, it loses strength. By the time it's over Lake Pontchartrain, when the city of New Orleans starts to flood, wind speed, it's a category one storm. So as with, unfortunately, some of the political times that we're in, you guys need to be a very careful consumer of information. And many folks in this disaster and in other disasters are, um, I don't want to ascribe a nefarious purpose, but, but many people expect you to not to be paying that close attention. You need to pay close attention because most people cannot. You guys are in a very fortunate position of having the luxury of studying this phenomenon. What's going on? Why did the people happen? Why did the people behave this way? Why did the levy happen that way? So it's your responsibility to make sure you understand all of these, these important elements. So category five, peak storm speed when it's out at sea. And this is what happens. Here's Hurricane Katrina. It's starting to form. Forms up, goes across, uh, smacks a little bit on Florida. Then boom, then it gets really strong. And boom, right up there, right up through New Orleans. Boom, and it forms, gets tighter. More and more wind, more and more wind, more and more wind. Tight, 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 zip, bam, right up there. So this is the time lapse of the couple days as it was coming, coming around the Florida panhandle and up. Incredibly powerful storm. So it wasn't the worst possible situation, but it was pretty darn close to the worst possible situation. This is an animation showing all these storms laid on on top of each other. <laughs> so favorable for Atlantic storm formation in 2005. We begin with the ocean. These are sea surface temperatures for the 2005 hurricane season, changing through time as the calendar advances. Warm water powers hurricanes. Orange and yellow areas show zones with water warmer than 82 degrees, the threshold favorable for hurricane development. Let's start the season again, this time adding clouds back into the picture. Atlantic Basin hurricanes typically form between June and November. Hurricanes often start as atmospheric disturbances off the coast of West Africa. Once out into the warm summer waters of the mid-Atlantic, some ripples begin to rotate and feeding off of warm water strengthen into hurricanes. Hurricanes require warm water to heat air above the ocean, causing a drop in air pressure. Lower air pressure sucks more water vapor into the storm, causing storms to strengthen. As hurricanes pass over warm water, they leave trails of relatively cooler water, so-called cold water trails. Numbers displayed over storm tracks indicate hurricane category changes. Strong shearing winds in the troposphere can disrupt this process, weakening yellow storms. But measurements indicate that there was very little shearing wind activity in 2005 to impede storm formation. Hurricanes are rare phenomena. Only about 80 or 90 appear worldwide every year.
Here comes Katrina. Storms stalked the Atlantic Ocean and eastern seaboard from June until early winter in 2005, and the record books are groaning under the strain of such a busy year. Consider this list of superlatives. An average year produces roughly 10 storms, 27 named storms formed in 2005. An average year... So Rita goes up the, the Texas side of Louisiana. We'll talk about that. An average year produces two major hurricanes, seven formed in 2005. On average, one Category 5 hurricane forms every three years. In 2005, there were three, Katrina, Rita, and Wilma. Wilma was the most intense Atlantic hurricane ever recorded, Katrina 4th, Rita 6th. But Katrina was the most destructive hurricane ever to hit the United States. The total losses from storms in 2005 include more than 1,200 lives and potentially more than $100 billion. So we're now into the this Greek letters, right? This some of the actual data that NASA and NOAA satellites measured this season. Data used to predict the paths and intensities of hurricanes. Satellite data play a vital role in helping us understand the land, ocean, and atmosphere systems that have such dramatic effects on our lives. And at the end, I think we show... January is crazy. Okay, so we have Katrina coming on in, doing its due. This is the, the eye of the hurricane, right? So this is the center, the winds are whipping around. And just to remind you guys, in the, in the eye, it's actually calm. So the winds, the wall, the eye wall, the, the area right around this area, it's, it's, the, it's massively spinning. But in the center here, it's, it's the so-called uh, eye of the storm, the calm of the storm. Let's talk about storm surge. Yeah? How big was the eye of Katrina again? Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember. It was probably on the order of about 50 miles. I'm not sure. So, let's talk about storm surge. So I think when we think about hurricanes, a lot of times we focus on the wind, and that's important, the rain, that's important. But a lot of the damage, especially in coastal areas, comes from storm surge. What's storm surge? Storm surge is get in your bathtub, well, Maybe don't get your bathtub, but 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 um, you can imagine a bowl of water, and then you plug in your hair dryer. That's why you shouldn't do this in the bathtub. But <laughs> plug in your hair dryer, and then and then put your hair dryer like next to next to the um, water, right, and blow. And what's happening? That water is piling up, right? So you're you're not you're not smacking the water. You're not you're not making the paddle in there or something. But just the fact the water is blowing over it. That's called fetch. The, the amount of the, the distance that wind is blowing consistently on that water mass is going to essentially pick up some of this water and pile it there. And then when it's piled up, it's easier for that wind to, to catch it and then pile it up more. And so hey, let's do the thought experiment. Imagine we're in this bathtub and, and we're, we have the hair dryer in the middle, just, just not underwater, but just on the surface blowing right next to the hair dryer a little bit and as soon as we get far to the edge of the bathtub it's going to be really big waves that's what storm surge is so storm surge is this wall of water that's moving in front of our storm so as this storm is coming in it's going to, it's pushing this lump of water in front of it and as the storm comes in as it's as it's way offshore that 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 lump is going to the, wa the water is going to start to rise 
going to rise. And as the storm gets closer, it's going to rise up more because that main core of the lump of water is getting closer and closer to the land, and then it'll overwash the land. Once the storm le once the storm, you know, on the storm track goes here and then goes on the land and dissipates, then immediately the storm surge will start to, to you know, the water will start to shrink back, wash back into the uh, ocean or the basin. Um, the highest storm surge in the U.S. mainland ever recorded was recorded during Hurricane Katrina, and it was recorded right here in Mississippi, 30 feet of storm surge. So let me make sure we understand that. That's not a wave that's 30 feet high. That is the water is 30 feet higher than the surface of the ocean for, who knows, two hours, three hours, four hours, eight hours. The whole coast goes subtidal. In a, in a storm like this. And remember, this is not California. This is not Malibu, this is not Santa Barbara coast. Everything is super, super flat. So when we have, a, this is essentially a 10 meter pile of water, everything is, is inundated, right? And then you have the issue with the rain, and then you have the, the wind and all that other stuff. So it's incredibly, incredibly impactful and, and challenging. Um, do I want to show that this is just the wind field? Um, this is the disaster area declared. I like this figure because it shows the state of California for, for comparison, right? So all of these hatched areas are, were a federally declared disaster area in the wake of the storm coming in. There's also a little chunk down here in Florida that happened early on. So for the purpose of the, of the mainland, I've, I've only made this red. But, but, but look at that. That's, the whole state of Louisiana is a federal disaster area. I mean, this is like Southern California, like all of Southern, Southern California, not a county or two counties. I mean, a huge, massive area. And you have to understand what that means because if we, if we have, let's say, a wildfire or – uh, you know, a hillside mudslide or something, that's really bad and people are really hurt and the infrastructure is really messed up. But we could call our neighbors in the valley over or in the next county or whatever. When it's your whole state, who are you going to call, right? It's, it's, it's a challenge. When the storm comes in, the first thing that happens is, is the, obviously the, the, the physical impact from the, um, from the winds and from the initial damage. So we see this initial impact. Here we see some stor storm surge where this coastal area has gone, it looks like a river now because the, the ocean has been pushed up so high and it's come on the land. We see flooding. We see a wind damage. We see um, structural failures as, as say bridges or, or houses or whatever um, give way. Um, these folks are in an apartment building and they're, they're, they weren't able to get out so they're, they're you know, trying to look, but it's super windy. The next thing, after we have that initial impact of the, of the you know, first wave of the storm coming over, then we really get this flooding. You can get flooding from a couple different ways. First and foremost, the system itself is dumping a bunch of liquid, a bunch of precipitation, right? So it's raining a lot. And again, it's, I can't emphasize that, this is not California, this is pancake, flat. So when it rains across the flat table, it's not like it's raining on the side of the mountain, right? That water doesn't have an, an easy place or a, 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 a super simple, uh, you know, gravity-fed place where it's going to go really quickly. So the water tends to stay for longer than if we were on the side of a steep cliff, for example. So we have that water coming in, and then we um, have all these containment things. Recall, we have these lips. We have all these bowls everywhere. Natural levees, flood walls, other depressions. So now when we bring this water in, it's, it's there. The city of New Orleans is pumped constantly. 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, just so the city, with just regular goings on, doesn't flood. So when we add the hurricane on, it really is a challenge. Yeah. So like um, you said that it's pumped 24 hours a day, but mm -hmm. what about like 
long time ago and that maybe technology... We invented these pumps about 100 years ago. Yeah, good question. So, so and this, I'll wait a little bit till we get to the, to the history. We talk about the, the colonization of Louisiana, but the short version is Louisiana, uh, uh, New Orleans is where New Orleans is because it was a portage. There's great shit. There were, there was great shellfish and, and, and mollusks and things in Lake Pontchartrain. Great fishing, easy fishing. So that's where people wanted to go. So the Native American tribes knew the places where the river was closest to Pontchartrain, and and they could, and so so that that's where um, the city of New Orleans is located. And so the original European explorers that came over. They were looking to set up a trading. They wanted to trade with folks, right? Set up some, some commerce. When they kept setting up down near the mouth of the Mississippi, it's low and it would flood. So the first permanent settlement is near New Orleans because that is one near this portage, but two, it's where you can find dry land that will stay dry the whole year long. So we originally put the first settlements on the highest high ground, it, it's relative, right? <laughs> there's, no, there's no massively tall thing, but still on, on the little lump of land that's five feet higher than the place over there is gonna be a lot drier. And so we started there. So what you'll see is the oldest parts of town, which are also the most valuable pieces of property, are on the highest ground. So then as we expand the city, and we, okay, we, now we want to put some houses for these guys. We're going to put it, I don't know, drain the swamp. Let's destroy that wetland and put some houses in there. And so we encroached more and more into the lower lands as we developed. And so as we did, that's what drove the need. Initially, you didn't need to pump. But as we started to move to these areas that were wetter, it, it required us essentially removing water from the, the soils. Cool? Okay, so the next thing you have is the flooding. So this water comes on in. Levees are breaking. Here we see, uh, here, here's one uh, levee that we'll visit. This is, I think this is 17th Street? I, I can't remember. Anyway, this is one of these levees. So this is intact. This side is intact. This is a levee and then a flood wall. This catastrophically failed. This should be a straight, can you guys see my cursor? This should be a straight line like this, just like on this other side. But it's, it's catastrophically failed and it's broken, you can see the wall is tumbled in and we can see the water pouring into the city. And now these houses are now basically underwater. These are the roofs of houses. Here's, a, here's the Coast Guard doing one of its you know, thousands of rescues. Here's another breach. And so again, here, here the, the, um, the levee is breached and you see the, the water rushing in. Here's a neighborhood that's flooded. Um, Let's have a look here. So this is Lake Pontchartrain. Is Lake Pontchartrain higher than the Mississippi or lower? Lower, lower right. So when we're draining the city, like we said, we have all these pumps. Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to suck the suck the water out of the out of the ground, out of the area, the low point, and then we're going to dump it somewhere. Where are we going to dump it? We're going to dump it to a drainage canal where gravity is going to pull it to the lowest point. We don't dump it into the river because the river is high we dump it into Pontchartrain. So this, think of this as a storm drain, right? So we're so in the normal goings on of New Orleans, we're, we're pumping, 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 and essentially dumping the water in here, and then that water is gonna flow down here and flow into Lake Pontchartrain. That's the, the, uh, that's the um, quick and dirty version of the, the dewatering system of New Orleans. So Lake Pontchartrain is salt water? Yeah, right. So, okay, and then, but have a look at this picture, right? Or, actually, sorry, have a look at this picture. This is a slightly closer version. So we're looking straight down. This is an aerial, um, uh, what is this? I can't remember. This is probably about two or three days after Katrina hit. But check it out. The roofs are mostly intact. I mean, we see some damage. Oh, absolutely, there's some damage. This, this building here has some damage in it. So the roofs are largely intact. There's some damage there. But the real thing is hydrology. Elevation is what was, by and large, the biggest determinant as to where the damage was. What survived, what was hurt. Why might that be important? 
Any guesses? Future plans. Uh, well, future plans, but 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 in the immediate wake, this this was this is a huge thing. Where to evacuate to? Uh, possibly, but I'm thinking more in terms of the long term impact of the storm. <coughs> and the, well, it's going to stay. It's going to stay, right. So the water is going to pond there for a while. So in other words, this, this is the high elevation. And again, this might only be a foot or a couple feet different, right? But so this is high. And so therefore, this property or this, this stuff was basically okay. This was low. This, got, this is going to be your house is sitting in it, right? It's sitting in it today. It's sitting in it tomorrow. It's sitting in it three days from now. It's going to just rot everything, right? We're going to have more pumps. Maybe we're to add more pumps. So it might be hard for you guys because you guys, I'm, I'm, I think none of you own a house, I think. <laughs> so for my house, I have insurance. And I have this thing to protect what's called an act of God. So a lightning bolt flies down and hits my house and catches my house on fire and burns my house up, right? Ah, right? Oops. Okay. My insurance company is going to come out to my house and go, okay, how many paintings did you have? How many dishes did you have? How many, you know, all that stuff. They're gonna add it up and they're gonna screw you, but you know, that's another story. So they're gonna look up and they're gonna say, okay, blah, 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 okay, here it is, here's your check. Because I determined it was an act of God. This is water. The water came in through the broken levees. Humans made the levees. So almost no one got insurance money. Families that had paid their policy every single year for 30, 40, 50, 60 years got nothing. Because the insurance company determined, well, actually the storm, the wind, the wind didn't hurt your house. The floodwaters hurt your house. And that was a human caused thing. That was an act of God. So you gotta go talk to the government. You can't sue the government. The Army Corps of Engineers are not suable, with, with um, a, a few very small exceptions that we'll talk about. But, but by and large, you can't sue, the, can't sue them. So here you have an entity that um, I would posit has not built a really robust structure. This is the, 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 some people take issue with this. But, but I'll just pause it for you for the sake of starting our discussion that they maybe didn't build it the way they should have built it to the standards. And as we go around here about these things, you're going to hear stuff and you're going to say, that can't possibly be right. That's crazy. When you guys take our intro GIS class and we say, make sure you have your datum right because we want to make sure we know what the real elevation is. Then you go to a major American city that was protected but, oh, sorry, we put the flood, the, the height of the wall, the height of the, the top of the flood wall was three feet too low. Haha, <laughs> sorry. How can that be? When you do that, you get an F on your test, right? How can that happen when it's protecting someone's livelihood, someone's lives, someone's family, all that kind of stuff? Well, it did. And those folks that were responsible for that, they don't, not held accountable. So another part of this class is what is justice? What is just? What is fair? People make mistakes all the time, we understand, but this is way beyond one person making an error. This is a systematic failure at every level. As we'll see, there are no, or there's very few good guys in this story. It's not the evil federal government. It's not the evil state government. It's not the evil local government. It's all this whole mishmash. Everybody has a hand in this phenomenon. Just like for us here in California, everybody's got a hand in it, right? Talk about the Oroville Dam. We talk about our levees here in Camarillo. S local jurisdictions are involved with that. Our flood control, control district is associated with that. The state has a role. The feds have a role. So, so it's not the fact that there's nobody to blame. <laughs> it's the fact that everybody seems to have... Um, to a greater or lesser extent, um, some culpability. Um, you might draw the conclusion that certain entities have more culpability than others, but, but, but it is true. There isn't one evil bad guy. It, it, we have to look really honestly in the mirror. So, so flooding, 
drives mo- much of the at least in at least in urban New Orleans, flooding drives most of the impact, and that flooding is deemed to be not an act of God. Uh, that's deemed to be a man. So a lot of our friends like Harry Shearer will really emphasize to you guys this was not a natural disaster. They're going to call this a man-made or a human-caused disaster, and they're and they're very. Uh, explicit about that for this very reason. So this is what this is. A, I, I changed the color up on this, but this is a this is um, an image of the flood protection system as it was just prior to uh, Katrina hitting. So here we go. Here's Pontchartrain over here. Here's the Mississippi, right? So we have these le- we have these flood walls and levees over all the waterways, but then we have. Check it out. We have so this is a drainage canal. So we have a levee on both sides. Drainage canal, levee, you know, levee and flood wall. So it's this huge mishmash of things. Each of these little black uh, squares is a failure in the levee protection system. So there wasn't a failure. There was failure upon failure upon failure upon failure. This is a massive, catastrophic, complete implosion of this protection system. There are cases like the Lower Ninth Ward that are dramatically bad, and, and understandably people, we pay attention to that, but realize there were breaks across the whole region. This is an absolutely amazing photograph. You guys might not appreciate it. This is one of the most amazing photographs in the entirety of the story of New Orleans. Yeah, guys, you guys haven't been there yet, so it's a little hard to understand. Remember that, that, cause, that, that, that bridge we talked about? That's what we're looking at. So here, this is the bridge, right? So we're looking at the footings of bridges. We're looking out, we're, we're, our, our butt is to the city, and we're looking out towards the, to Lake Pontchartrain. And so I don't, it's unclear how this guy survived <laughs> that took this photo. But um, he, he uh, turned around and took this photo. And what you're seeing is storm surge. This is the top of the levee down here. This is a fence on the top levee. The water is above the levee. So essentially the sea is just unimpeded flowing into the city. I mean, insane, insane. Imagine what force is involved with that. I just crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, this is actually right by where we were robbed th- uh, two, three years ago. Um, but so this is, um, this is the thing I mean, there's a lot of things you'll experience as, as you're reading this stuff, as, as we're visiting. But this, to me, is the one that I just, it, it, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. I just don't understand how anybody can let this happen. So here we are. So we're looking, if we go follow our line of sight, down here is um, Lake Pontchartrain. Okay. So here, this is, this is one of our drainage canals. Again, the idea is we're going to pump this area dry. Put that water in this canal and it's going to gravity feed down, 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 down and go to Lake Pontchartrain. So this here, recall, this is the levee because this is the earthen berm. And then this, which is this extra elevation, is the flood, is a flood wall. And so the idea here is, and this, this is this is a you know residential area, so it's like big, big fancy houses basically in this part of town. And so uh, the idea is, hey, we want this protection of this levee, but we want it actually bigger. We can't really make it bigger, right? So we make it bigger, this, instead of the, the toe of the levee being here, the, the toe of the levee is gonna be you know, way over here, maybe even in the street. And so we have limited space, so let's use the flood wall. So they put it up here. Now, what you can't see is what's at my butt. What's at my butt is this brick house. It's the pump house. It's the thing that's sucking up the water and with, with you know tubes and, and all the, Mechanics, and it's going to dump it into the um, dump it into the drainage canal. It just so happens at this point that it's co-located with the sewer system, the sewer line. Uh, so I mean, they don't mix, but 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 the, but it's the same. But they're right next to each other. So this goes for miles, right? <laughs> Are you guys with me on this? All of a sudden, it just stops here, right? Why? Because right over here is the brick of the building, of the pump house, 
that has some of the sewer stuff in it. They decided we can't connect the flood wall to the brick building. Why, you say? Well, because what if it starts to flood? If it starts to flood and this wall were to break, it would rip down part of the sewer system. Then we have poop spilling all around. So therefore, therefore, we won't complete the flood wall. Right? You guys have heard the link is only as strong as the weakest link. So that means we've, they just spent all of your money and all of our money and all of our time and effort to build this protection system right here that doesn't protect anything. Because if the water in the canal were to ever get this high, it's just going to flood out here. And it's going to go flood these houses. So this flood wall does literally nothing. Again, this wasn't one person's. This, this, is, this has been, it was, it was this way for decades, right? What? How, what? what? Right? Just, what? It's just insane. I, I just, I, I, it's hard to understand. Uh, turns out, ironically, the reason this neighborhood probably survived was because we had this relief valve. So, when, so essentially what happened was the storm surge was building up water just like this, right? And, and the water was essentially whipping around and coming now from the north and, and shoving down, because remember how, those, how the storm rotates, shoving it down and pushing that big wedge of water into New Orleans. And so in this case, it's coming right up these canals and these canals are failing. This one didn't fail because it essentially had this relief valve, release valve. So the water never got so high that it made the thing tumble down. You get what I'm saying? So water flowed into here and flooded this neighborhood, but only for a few hours. As soon as the storm left and as soon as the storm surge dropped, then the water level dropped down. And so this neighborhood was relatively lightly flooded. So ironically, that turned out to be a smart thing, not having a flood wall. It only flooded temporarily as opposed to the entirety of this whole levee system imploding, falling in, and being, you know, requiring months and months and months to repair. This is the Orleans Canal. Um, I, think, I think we'll, st well, we'll start with eye walls next time. I think, I think, I think uh, it's getting late. I don't think we can we'll finish.